let's go ahead and start. Uh, today we have Dr. Edward Golub uh, presenting at the AI seminar series. Dr. Golub is a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas San Antonio, and he received his doctoral degree in experimental psychology from Dartmouth and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Neurology at the University of California, Irvine. And Dr. Golub studies the auditory system and focuses on spatial learning and attention, as well as relationships between auditory perception and action. His lab uses EEG and event-related potentials, TMS and MRI in tandem with signal processing, AI and cognitive modeling to study human auditory processing and changes associated with brain aging and neurological disorders. The common denominator is the broad question of how other cognitive systems such as attention, short and long-term memory interact with sensory processing in the auditory system. So they have recently done some collaborative research where they are using different types of AI methods to read out cortical spatial attention codes and to predict whether upcoming speech in people who stutter will be fluent or disfluent. So let's give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Gola. I'm excited to listen to his talk. Well, thanks for having me here. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, I don't know if it's just having more time to putter around the house and ponder. Um, but I've been thinking a little bit about kind of how I got to this point in, in my career. And I've been at UTSA for four years. And um, in all these wonderful collaborations that we've managed to spring up um, in that time, and I was just kind of thinking that the, the, there is a common denominator here um, on kind of, you know, I, I feel like I kind of got to the place I needed to be <laughs> in a weird way. Um, so when I was an undergraduate, I don't know if, if other people had the same experience, but I read a book called Chaos uh, by James Gleek, and it just blew my mind about nonlinear dynamics and complex systems and, and how that may be important for lots of things in the physical world. And in, in my, you know, it's pretty naive. I thought, well, gee, I wonder if the brain works that way, um, not knowing that other people had already thought of that and that, that there was a, a, virgin, a beginning literature on that topic. Um, but it really interested me, just kind of the idea of a bunch of small, uh, a lot of small elements that are weakly interactive and how that can give rise to complex um, patterns and behavior. Uh, I was also interested in the mind-body problem. You know, what is it about uh, the brain in our heads that gives rise to our, our sense of self, consciousness, uh, this experience that we have as we go through life? Um, is it, you know, you got your mind and your body and the two just kind of weakly interact like Descartes would say? Uh, or is it like the church lens that would say, you, you understand the brain and that's really all you need to understand, full stop. That's, don't, you don't need to get into all this kind of mind and soul business. And then lastly, in my roommate in my freshman year named Stan, he was a fairly troubled soul with a good heart. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why does he do what he does? And so all these kind of influences eventually got me into uh, neuroscience. And this idea of these nonlinear dynamics and patterns was always kind of bugging me as far as what does that actually mean? What is that telling us about brain function? And that led to this really one of the most basic assumptions in the field of, of neuroscience, which is that the brain is an organ and it has a basic job in the same way that other organs like the, the heart uh, functions as a pump and the liver is basically a filter, that the brain is an information processor in the abstract sense. And so that's really its function. And when I talk about information processing the brain, I'm, I'll mostly talk about cognition. What we think about is kind of more sort of rational mechanistic kind of um, thinking, but it also applies to emotions. So the, the assumption here is that our emotions are also computed by brain circuits. Um, consciousness is just one part of that information processing. It's probably a very small part. So what, we're, what we can access introspectively, um, many other things such as perception uh, happen automatically. You can't introspect and figure out exactly why you perceive the, the world around you in three dimensions. You just do. When you try to remember something, it just kind of happens. You don't go through it manually. <laughs> and how you retrie retrieve information, it happens. You don't know exactly how it happens. So that's what I mean by information processing is a much broader system in, in the brain than just this little crux at the, of it that uh, we can um, feel in terms of consciousness. All right. 
This is I'm trying to advance the slide. Okay, here we go. Um, now, as far as computation goes, I'm using this in the broad sense, uh, like one would use it uh, for a cognitive science um, in the field of cognitive science, that the actual computations can be implemented in a lot of different physical mediums. So addition, for example, you can use your fingers or a calculator or an abacus. Um, you can get clever about it and set up a weight system that's proportional to numeric value. Uh, and the brain does computations as well. So this really, there's a, a very natural deep link between AI and the brain that they both deal with information science, right? And so that's why uh, um, some of the research that I'm telling you about, uh, that I will tell you about uh, in a minute, uh, really just kind of the, the overlap between those areas and asking what, how can we use AI to better understand information processing of the brain? Now, sometimes the, the information being processed is somewhat obvious. So if you um, stick an electrode, a very fine wire into the hippocampus and get it close enough to neurons in the hippocampus, this is one part of the brain, uh, and you, you do this in a rat and you allow the rat to walk around, what you'll oftentimes find is that if this, um, I hope you can see that my little um, this white pointer here, I'm guessing that you probably can. Um, but anyway, this is, imagine this is an overhead view of a cylindrical arena and you have Joe Rat hooked up with um, an electrode measuring a neuron, that neuron will fire when the rat goes to certain parts of this um, arena. In this case, the bottom, you know, like between six and maybe eight o'clock at the bottom. Uh, and it fires very little in many other parts of the arena. And so the idea of here is, and this was discovered in the early 1970s, is that maybe these neurons are coding for space. Uh, that has something to do with representing this part of space uh, by a particular neuron and different parts of space in this arena would be coded by other neurons. And if you think about this population of neurons together, they basically perform, have a representation of, they tile over the entire space and have a representation of locations within that arena. And sure enough, if you um, do a simulation and you ask how many of these place cells will I need to measure before I can read out um, come up with a good estimate of where the animal actually is in space. It doesn't take that many neurons to come up with a pretty good estimate of where the, the animal is in space. So this is an example of uh, information processing in the brain that is pretty intuitive. You can um, look at it um, and just kind of get a sense of, oh, oh yeah, I see that that's probably coding for place. That, that's, a, that's good. And this actually led to a Nobel Prize a few years, years ago by John O'Keefe. Uh, there are many other um, uh, similar such representations of head direction, uh, there's kind of a, a grid network um, that cells represent, other sorts of spatial representations as well. So later on, I'm going to talk about space and why that may be a particularly useful way to use AI to understand brain coding, because we already know that there are a lot of fairly intuitive spatial codes that exist in the brains of mammals, including humans. All right, so other codes are not always so obvious. So you can think about uh, the, the ancient uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean, uh, there's the Mycenaeans had this linear B that took a long time for people to decode, but eventually these, uh, these uh, figures here, um, the meaning was eventually uh, made evident by cryptographers. Linear A, which is actually an older language, still hasn't been cracked. Um, but it, this kind of gets at the idea that some codes, even if you are pretty clear on kind of what you're measuring, uh, their meaning is not always that clear. Uh, and so that's the situation that I think we're faced with the brain, this very uh, complex system with many interactive elements at spatial and temporal scales. Much of the code that we see, um, we don't understand. And so this is just one example of some very common um, observations in human neuroscience. So if you use functional MRI to uh, get a, a, an estimate of neural activity in different parts of the brain, and you have people just lie down in an MRI scanner for several minutes, and you measure the slowly uh, changing activity in the order of seconds, what you find is some parts of the brain tend to co-vary together. Um, so for example, uh, at the very bottom, the salience network, there's a region of the brain that I'm circling here that's more towards the, the in the parietal lobe uh, that co-varies with the region up here in the frontal lobe. This is called the salience network. So when blood flow goes to one part of the brain and it increases, blood flow likely increases in the other part of the brain as well. And, and that's what's shown over here um, in the lower left, showing that this you can have fairly tight correlations between these 
dynamic changes in blood flow in different parts of the brain. We can also measure this with electrical activity that's shown up in the upper right with EEG and MEG. And I'm gonna talk a fair amount about EEG in this um, talk and, and I'll give you a, a little background on that in a few slides. Um, so you can define these networks. Great, even just at rest, not doing any specific task. Those same networks or pieces of those networks are also systematically um, activated when people perform tasks. When you ask them to do an attentional task, for example, that salience network may um, become activated um, depending on, on the particular task. But those same parts of the brain are activated for lots of other reasons as well. So you, you have this many to one problem where there's a particular tissue in the brain that's active for lots of different things. Uh, so that suggests to me at least that we really don't understand the coding of these areas. We've described these co-variations, but we don't understand what they mean in terms of information processing yet. But it's very systematic. It's a general property of the brain. So it's most likely something important that we need to understand better. All right, so how can one do that? Well, maybe, you know, I'm talking very long term here. We could have sort of a Rosetta Stone type um, guidance going on here. In that if we could try to connect what we already know about the brain um, with things that are just a little bit beyond what we know, unfamiliar, um, then we can make progress in decoding some of these neural codes that I've been talking about. Um, and the problem here is that with neural activity, it's probably high dimensional, maybe nonlinear, for example. Um, or there may be multiple dimensions, not just a simple kind of space code, which is two dimensional that I talked about with the play cells, maybe five dimensional, which isn't intuitive to people. Um, so that, that's a difference versus trying to decode a language where there's a concept of a cup that's in hieroglyphics. And there's probably also a Greek um, word for that as well, of course. Um, so you need to kind of match up the two to the same concept. Uh, so with the brain, it's, it's probably you know, much more challenging, um, challenging uh, problem. But here's where thinking more about and using interpretable AI could help propel this, this uh, enterprise forward with trying to get some sense of if we can understand a little bit about AI being able to make predictions based on neural codes, if we can get a better understanding of how AI does that, that can maybe help us understand the neural coding of the brain in general. And so I think we're, we're moving slowly in the field towards more quantitative models. So instead of thinking about how, um, how memory may work in terms of, okay, I'm encoding information and now I'm storing it and now I'm gonna retrieve it again, we may end up having some equations that, that that quantifies those processes. And it may not be as intuitive as I'm storing information in the same way that I could store information in the refrigerator and pull it out later, you know, store food in the refrigerator and pull it out later. Uh, so these intuitive metaphors may fade away and we'll replace them with, with quantitative you know, equations, for example. Uh, so that's probably a very long-term uh, prospect, but that's kind of what, what a lot of us are in this for, to try to decode really how does the brain actually work and do that in a rigorous fashion. All right, so are there any questions at this point before I kind of move on to some of the more specific stuff we're doing? All right, so as far as kind of a lot of the, the basics here, so we can measure electrical activity from the brain by using caps that have uh, metal electrodes sewn into the cap and you just stick it on the, the subject's head make sure you have a good electrical connection. And you can pick up some of the electrical currents that are generated by neurons in the brain. Those, the patterns of those electrical current, currents reflect information processing in the brain. So we can get some sense of these um, spatial temporal patterns of activity in the brain that reflect information processing. We can supply some information about what the subject is doing in a task. So for example, we can have them attend to the far left side of space. And then maybe we may ask them to switch their attention to the right side of space. Um, with that information, we should get different neural codings for these two different attention conditions. And depending on what you wanna do with the AI machine learning, you can give some of that information to the AI network uh, for training. And I'll try to be... Yes? And as we move forward, I'll try to be more specific about kind of what information was used for training up these various AI networks and what information was left out. Okay, so this is just a, a quick um, showing of how these electrical currents are actually generated by individual neurons in the brain that an EEG electrode is picking up. 
any one neuron generates just very small currents and you have a big skull in the way that functions as a resistor. So you're not gonna measure activity from one neuron using EEG, but you can measure synchronous activity from many neurons. Many I'm talking you know, tens of thousands to, to hundreds of thousands, and that, that's the order of magnitude that we're talking here. Um, when you do that, you can present a stimulus multiple times and record the neural response multiple times. And if you average that, you can reveal, you can reduce the noise that's random from each time you present a stimulus and just reveal um, the specific voltage associated with that stimulus. So that's called an event-related potential. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and what I'm showing in the lower left-hand corner is an event-related potential that plots voltage up and down, positive is up over time. And these are short periods of time. Uh, that, we're, that I'll be talking about, generally less than a second or so. And a lot of these measures are really you know, tens of milliseconds, uh, these dynamics come and go. So it's pretty rapid, which is one reason why we use EEG. If we're interested in these rapid changes in information processing in the brain, you want to be able to have your measurement keep up, and EEG is able to do that. Uh, one other thing that we can do, in addition to measuring local activity in particular parts of the brain, we can also measure relations between different parts of the brain. Uh, the method that I'll talk about later is called coherence. Uh, and that also gets at kind of how networks form, how different parts of the brain may be jointly recruited in order to process information. And these can be fleeting coalitions that they may form and go away within 100 milliseconds or so. Um, but that's some of, you know, the, the brain has to have these complex information processing in, in order for us to be as, you know, as smart as we think we are. <laughs> we're probably not as smart as we think we are, but we're reason humans are pretty smart. And you need to have some sophisticated information processing in the brain, even be asking questions about how can I study information processing in the brain. Uh, so network activity is assumed to be, you know, very important in terms of um, how human cognition works. All right. So I've been studying spatial cognition in various guises uh, for a while. And one of the main approaches in my lab um, uses spatial cognition in tandem with artificial intelligence methods. And so at this point, you may be asking yourself, why spatial cognition? Why, why not study other things? Why not study language, for example, which is perfectly good to study. It's just not kind of my main, main interest. Uh, and these are some of the reasons why I think spatial cognition may be particularly helpful for AI in, in this decoding problem I've been talking about. One is that space is a commonality for every life form on Earth, and even things such as bacteria have differential responses based on spatial position of, of things around them, uh, such as nutrient gradients. Uh, so this is something that any sort of, um, any, any organism, much less an animal brain, uh, would need to deal with. And sure enough, we see spatial representations in all sorts of animals, not just humans, obviously. Uh, space can be diced up in different ways. Uh, so the lo location of my coffee cup, for example, can be defined relative to where my left hand is. It can be defined relative to my head. It can be defined relative to the chair. It can be defined relative to the room. I could put his GPS coordinates in, right? These are all different reference frames for where the cup is. Uh, spatial information is generally analog. So the cup is, oh, I don't know, three feet away from me. I could move it to be 3.5 feet away from me or I could get it closer at 2.5 feet. So having this analog representation of space is helpful when you do experiments because you can define kind of an input output function or a dose response function. And that can be useful when you're trying to decode activity in the brain. And like I mentioned earlier, we know a lot about how space is represent, represented in the mammalian brain. So that's also an advantage uh, for this, uh, you know, the goal of decoding information processing in the brain. So, I, I have a background and do a lot of experimental psychology uh, experiments where you bring people into the lab um, and we study uh, young college age students uh, all the way up to people who are quite old um, and you just bring them to the lab and you, you try to study cognition in a very uh, controlled fashion. Right, so you, you set up a lab situation where you isolate the specific aspects of cognition that you're most interested in, and then you try to control everything else. So, so that means the tasks tend to be pretty boring, uh, but that's okay. You know, students like extra credits, and so they'll, they'll come in and do your boring task for a half hour or even up to an hour or so. Uh, so one way that we study spatial attention, which is what I'm going to talk about first, in, in the auditory modality, is we have people attend to a region in space. And so what we're looking over here at over here in the lower left corner, imagine looking down on top of the subject's head, 
and we can place speakers around the subject. In this case, each one of these circles represents a speaker. Uh, we can also use virtual reality sounds and just use headphones that are perceived as coming from the outside world. Uh, the, the results are basically the same either way you do it. And we can tell them, okay, attend to one location here and then make a simple judgment about the sound that you hear at that location or any of these other locations, any of these five locations. And so we have them make a judgment about white noise, which sounds kind of like and we amplitude modulate at a different rate. So if you increase the volume up and down at a slow rate, it sounds kind of like cards being shuffled. And if you change that amplitude modulation rate to be faster, it sounds like a buzz. So that these two very easy aspects of the sound that you're hearing, and we tell them to press one button when you hear the buzz and another button when you hear the shuffle. Uh, we do this uh, for quite a few trials, generally around 300 trials or so for each condition that we're looking at. And then we can use that, we record EEG while they're doing all that. And then we can use those trials to analyze the electroactivity in the brain as a function of variables that we manipulate in the experiment. All right. Um, and so if you just look at reaction time, we can get behavioral measures of, of spatial representations, right? You think about what's the purpose of the brain any, at all. For the most part, the rubber hits the road with behavior, that really the, the brains are there to generate behavior as well as some internal regulation. Um, but for the most part, it's to generate intelligent behavior. And um, so what we're looking at here is, imagine you're hearing sounds and we tell somebody to attend to negative 90, which is in the far left. And we can plot the reaction time for this choice response for the amplitude modulation rates at that location. And so that's shown over here um, when I'm circling with the pointer. And that's pretty fast. And if we occasionally present a sound 45 degrees away, so that's it's like the 1030 location on, a, on an analog clock, um, their reaction time slows down a lot. Now it's up at you know, 540 milliseconds or so. And the reaction time gets a little slower as you get farther away from the attended location. And then it begins to speed up when you get to the opposite hemisphere. So we get this interesting inverted U-shaped function uh, for the reaction time as a function of where is the sound in space relative to where they're attending in space. And we can plot this out by having them attend to different locations. We can attend to straight ahead at midline at zero degrees. And in this case, you get this M-shaped reaction time function where it slows down at the nearby location and speeds up at the far locations. Uh, the same thing works when you attend to the far left, which is shown over here in orange. Uh, so this is suggesting that we can, we're, that attention, auditory attention, at least in terms of behavior, is kind of spread out over space and it's concentrated wherever you happen to be voluntarily focusing attention. It diminishes as you get farther away from that. And then we see some benefits for performance in terms of reaction time when you get really far away from, from the attended location. So this was a, a bit of a puzzle that we've been working on in the lab to try to understand exactly how, what information processing leads to that observed result. Ed, I have a question. This sure. is Alfonso. How are you today? Hi there, there. Is, there is any reason to not use also sound coming from behind? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that. We didn't actually plan this, but this slide that I'm showing you is um, results from a similar experiment where we surrounded the subject with an array of speakers, eight speakers that went all the way around them in front and in back. Yeah, because we're interested in auditory attention, which can be panoramic. And, uh, which is unlike what you get with vision where you're limited to things that are in your visual field, which is only about 160 degrees to the left and to the right, 120 degrees up and down. Um, so we can use EEG in conjunction with um, some advanced signal processing methods to take into account the, the biophysics of the brain and the skull uh, to try to define where in the brain the electrical currents are generated that we're measuring from the scalp. And so I don't want you to, to try to absorb all this information that I just plotted out here. Uh, but I just want to pull out a few examples of the type of codes that we can get by measuring EEG. One code is if we measure the activity in auditory cortex, there's a smaller response for sounds that are on the same side as the auditory cortex versus the opposite. So if we measure left auditory cortex, it has a bigger response to sounds on the right side of space. And the opposite pattern is seen when you look at the right auditory cortex, it has a bigger response in terms of current to sounds on the left side of space. Uh, and that's already been known from recordings of individual neurons and animals, and, and uh, you can also record intracranially in humans sometimes. So this is one coarse spatial code that reflects where is the sound relative to um, the head 
and other parts of the brain that are involved in attention. So these attention networks connect with the, the auditory cortex, the visual cortex, somatosensory cortex. Uh, and one area is shown here in abbreviated FEF, which stands for frontal eye fields. Uh, and you can see that there's this kind of a, a, a coarse gradient, not that different from parts of the reaction time curve that we saw, except it keeps going up and up and up, uh, that we can pull out. And this occurs within about 1 16th of a second or so after a sound is presented. So these are pretty rapid responses that are seen. But this coding shifts 100 milliseconds or so later. Um, as you know, Alfonso mentioned um, this issue of well, what about front versus back? This area has a larger response when the sounds are in front of you versus the same locate left right location when it's behind you. So that's what's shown over here in the black line. So we're getting a coding not only of kind of where's the sound in left right space, it also matters whether the sound is coming from in front of you versus behind you. So that's yet another spatial representation that we're able to um, read out in, in a coarse way using EEG. And there are several other ones here um, that, that I don't want to get into too much detail on. Just maybe one last one here is that these, we can measure these gradients relative to the attended location. And the ones before here have kind of a V shape. You see that? After about between 400 and 500 milliseconds after the sound is presented, that V-shaped gradient turns upside down. So we see there's this kind of, uh, and we reported on this, this replicated results that we saw in a somewhat different paradigm, um, that these spatial gradients are actually changing very rapidly and are representing different types of information within you know, 50, 100 milliseconds or so. So even in this relatively simple task, there's a lot of spatial information to keep track of. Um, now, Within this task, I want to just kind of pull out some other spatial information that we could be analyzing and show you the, the scope of the problem as far as how many, the type of complex patterns we may be able to identify and why AI may help us in that respect. So we can have people attend to a certain location in space. We can present sounds from different locations in space. Uh, it turns out that where your hand is matters for your performance as well. So the locate, if the hand is at the same location, more or less is where the sound is coming from, you're actually faster to respond than if you have to respond to a sound on your right side of, of, of your head with your left hand. Uh, so there's a, a spatial code for where your hand is that interacts with the spatial code for where the sound is. And when we're using EEG, we can measure different parts of the cortex, cortical activity, at least at a coarse level. Um, as I mentioned, this timing after the stimulus is presented, things change rapidly. And you can look at different frequency bands in the EEG. You can think of the EEG. So Jerisha had, it looks like a piano uh, in the background. Uh, and um, so the EEG is sort of like a piano in that you have different frequencies within the EEG, low frequencies, you know, less than one hertz. Uh, we can measure DC potentials actually, uh, all the way up to, you know, you can go much higher, but generally we look up to 100 hertz. So there are different frequency bands as well. You go through all the com combinations, and initially I thought maybe I should try to calculate this, and then I got a headache and decided to just forget about it. There are lots and lots of possibilities just for linear combinations of attended locations, sound locations, hand locations, EEG measures. That's not taking into account potential nonlinear relations. And since we're running humans, there are lots of other things that we can do in terms of individual differences, the age, sex, gender, personalities, clinical conditions, cultural effects. We, may, we can measure other aspects of brain function using functional MRI or psychophysiology measures other than EEG. There's a whole lot of possibilities. So this opens the door to maybe we could use some help from AI methods to um, understand these codes better. All right. So, hello. yes. Hi, I had a quick question. Sure. So uh, normally when you're trying to uh, localize audio like sp the spatiality of the audio mm -hmm. um especially in three-dimensional space you would need three sensors to triangulate a particular point um so how would how do two ears uh yeah. Code, yeah. how do they figure out three-dimensional audio it, it's complicated and distance perception with, with uh hearing is particularly challenging just because of what you're saying. So um, so we basically use kind of two, we don't have the triangulation, we have two points, right? Comparison right. between signals at each ear. 
can give you some sense in the left, right, the, the horizontal plane where sound is coming from. And then as far as the distance dimension to that, it's very coarse for starters. So we're not that good at, the, uh, at perceiving distance with sound. But some of it depends on, on the room where you're in or if you're in an open field, the acoustics. Some of it depends on, a lot of it depends on your knowledge about the typical sound level of what you're hearing. Uh, you know, if, for example, if you see um, a motorcycle revving up, um, I used to have, you know, up until recently, I had a Harley that had you know, some pretty loud pipes on it. So I know about how loud that was. So I could use that to get a sense of if somebody else were riding my motorcycle about how far away it was. After that experience, it's harder to, to gauge um, the level. Uh, so it's the sort of thing where, um, and I think that's an, another example where the auditory system can work in tandem with the visual system. So what often happens if you hear a sound that's out of your visual field, what oftentimes happens if it's salient is you turn and look, you turn your eye, you move your eyes, you turn your body, and then you get a much more precise sense of how far away the, the source is. So have you observed that uh, the, the people that you've tested with their eyes open versus their eyes not open? It, does it affect the signal that you're measuring? Um, well, we're actually, we have some pilot data trying to get at um, the impact of a vision on spatial hearing and spatial attention. Uh, so the front back data that I showed you earlier suggests there may be something about a sound that's in the visual field that that means it's processed differently than the sound that's outside the visual field. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have some data also where we have people blindfolded. Uh, and we didn't uh, test distance perception. So we keep the speakers at the same distance or virtual sounds at the same distance, depending on the experiment. Um, but that's something, you know, I'd, I'd like to get it not only kind of um, having the distance dimension to auditory spatial hearing in, in future work and also motion, which is another thing that I'm not going to talk about today, but it's also pretty important. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is um, an experiment that we uh, did with even an even simpler way to measure spatial coding in, in the EEG and then um, connect it with an AI collaborative project that, that we did at, at UTSA. And so we can make our task even simpler by presenting sounds in these five different locations like I showed you before. And then simply tell people, when you hear a sound at a target location, press a button. That's all you have to do. So it's even simpler than the previous task that I described. So you can have your target over here, let's say far left-hand side, and then sounds are presented from all these locations. They're equally likely. So 20% of the time they show up at each one of these five locations. And then we can measure EEG while the subjects are doing this task. The idea here is that they're voluntarily focusing their attention, that they're listening to us, and we say, please attend to the left, and they actually are attending to the left. And that there should be some sort of attentional gradient that's concentrated right at the far left and then diminishes as, as the sound as it gets farther away in space from where they're attending. And we wanted to measure EEG to try to understand some of the codes that may be invoked when they do this very simple task. And uh, so we found that indeed we can measure scalp event related potentials. That's what the ERP uh, means. And that we can get these progressive changes in the brain response as the sounds get farther and farther away from where the person is attending. And we fit this as a linear function. So we are hypothesizing that there'd be a linear gradient. And so we fitted this to a linear function. And to help identify when these linear gradients uh, may be operative after a sound is presented, we just plotted the slope, which is what's shown here under C. And you can see here that um, shortly after the sound is presented, starting around 150 milliseconds or so, you get this kind of big, kind of almost pyramid shape going up here that peaks at about a third of a second after the sound is presented. That's one slope that, that appears, a spatial code, right? And, and then goes away. And then another spatial code comes back starting about a half a second after the sound is presented. We found a third spatial code that started right when the first one was about to end uh, and that went for a few hundred milliseconds, and then that came back up to baseline as well. And we plotted this topography. So this is looking down on the subject's head, and we plotted the, the voltage of these slopes. And you can see each one of these three codes um, starting and finishing, and another one starting and finishing, and then the third one uh, shows up as well. Uh, so even within this ridiculously simple task, we get this very pretty complex pattern of spatial coding that occurs over time and also in different places in the brain. All right, so enter the Yufei Huang at UTSA and Tim Liu, his student. Uh, they entered the scene. 
And we wanted to know whether or not we could use an AI network to try to uh, pull out these codes and then maybe also pull out some codes that we didn't know were even there in EEG, right? That's the whole point is not to just be redundant and show that AI can identify things that humans can. We want AI to use its, um, it, its uh, you know, superior ability to pull out really fine-grained codes, presumably, uh, and, and show that to us to help us understand the coding in more depth. Uh, so we had 44 subjects doing the tasks I just described. Uh, and we input that information to a machine learning network. And I'm going to give a little more information on that next, uh, with the goal of trying to see whether or not the network would recognize these spatial and temporal codes that I just showed you. And so this is the way it works. So we had the EEG input. We had two conditions where the subjects were attending to the left side of space or the right side of space. And we also had our five stimulus locations. Uh, that was input into two convolutional neural networks. Uh, so we had 64 electrodes on the subject's head. So that's where the 64 comes from uh, in the CNN. Uh, and it was one dimensional um, vector. And we could view these different spatial filters um, using topographic plots, just like what I showed you before, that, that top down view of the subject's head with the voltage readout. That information was then passed to a temporal filter so we could get the time course of these, these spatial filters. Uh, and then we took that eventually to a classification. And the goal was to predict uh, one of three things. Um, so the first network that was trained up, the goal was to predict where are the sounds coming from you know, in this kind of left-right plane. And we collapsed across left and right sides because it was basically the same sort of results. So we wanted to kind of get a rank ordering of the sound locations. The, the network was given information about where the subject was attending. It wasn't trained up on sound location. The second goal was to do the opposite. So we, we fed in labeled uh, information about the sounds location. We didn't tell the network where the subject was attending. And then the classification was whether or not they were attending to the left or the right side of space. And then the third was a network that was trained up uh, on, on both of that information. Uh, and then we wanted to see you know, how well it performed for the first two tasks when, we, when it had this richer uh, training experience. And then here's some of the details. I'm, you know, I'm presuming some of the people in the audience are, you know, hardcore AI people. Um, I, I was a little, uh, I'm a little scared to put this up here because I, I don't know a lot of the details about these particular parameters and everything here. So please don't ask me about the specifics on this. But but I know generally conceptually kind of what we're trying to do here. But anyways, this is some of the information about these two models uh, that we that we used. And this is showing. Uh, the area under the curve for the model's ability to uh, distinguish the sound locations, our first question, right? Where's the sound coming from? And it, it was very good at, at defining kind of the most lateral sound, the farthest left or farthest right. And then it was okay at figuring out where the sounds are coming from for these intermediate positions as you get farther away from the le far left and far right. So we got some success with this. Um, with the, the, the chance would be, you know, just, um, if it was just guessing, it would be 0.2, you know, 20% of the time. So it's well above chance for this. And this is an example of the type of um, coding that we got from that spatial filter layer. And notice here, this is showing um, voltage or you know, proxies for voltage. And it's very tight. There's the positive over here in red and blue negative. They're right next to one another. You usually don't see this with um, a lot of uh, human EEG, typically it's more spread out. Uh, so we're thinking that maybe this AI network, one benefit may be that it's pulling out more kind of spatially distributed activity in the brain, which would correspond to smaller pieces of cortex being active and generating the signals that the AI network is in turn uh, recognizing. In terms of the, the temporal filter, this showed those same sort of gradients that I laid out uh, earlier with the scalp EEG. Uh, so indeed the, the temporal filter was uh, keying in on these spatial gradients uh, that we saw, which was good. We put in a known and then um, got that known back. So it's, it's, we know it's, it's working reasonably well. Some of the initial responses were different here. It's picking up some subtleties here that we may not have known about before. So we're going to, in the future, look at this in more detail. Uh, and the slope plot that I showed you earlier for these spatial gradient slopes, we saw a similar slope plot here um, also that was detected with, with the convolutional neural network. Uh, predicting the attended location, that was also, you know, pretty good. The area under the curve was 0.9. And again, the, the chance there would have been 50-50. So that 
Our second goal also, um, we made some progress on that. The network was able to read out you know, where somebody was attending in space. And keep in mind, this is covertly, they're just saying in my head, okay, I'm attending to the left side and continue to do that. Um, so in, in a very kind of low level way, it's, it's sort of like mind reading, you know, in a very coarse way, uh, which is another way of saying we're trying to read out these brain codes, right? And find out what they mean. In this case, it, it corresponded to their subjective sense, that conscious sense of attending to one location in space. All right, and then lastly, when we had this multitask model that had information about the attended uh, as well as the stimulus location, uh, the ability to um, predict the attended location got a little better. The AUC was up to 0.93. Uh, judging the stimulus locations, that went down a little bit, uh, but it was still well above chance. And in our recent results, we've been using this array of speakers that goes all the way around a subject using eight speakers instead of five. Um, we did the same thing with, with we used the same uh, modeling, but with three subjects, and we got a lot more data per subject, four hours of EEG per subject that came in on multiple days to, to get this large data set. And it was pretty good at predicting where the attended location was. Here they had four locations to choose from, the network had four locations to choose from, front, back, left, and right. Uh, and it was correct 87% of the time. So it wasn't that different from when it only had two choices to make in, in the first set of studies. So, so we're encouraged by this, that this, this approach of using this, this uh, convolutional neural, neural networks to read out these spatial codes so far seems to be working reasonably well. All right, I'm just trying to keep track of time here. I think I'm gonna need to um, cut out some of the slides here on this next phase of what we're doing which is using stuttering as a model system to understand brain dynamics. And, and we see this kind of multi-stability in other aspects of, of cognitive psychology. So one thing, if you look at, um, let's say the duck rabbits, this is a book my, my kids have. Um, you can look at this as either this, the, when you look at it's facing to the left and this is a duck and this is its beak, or you can perceive this as a rabbit facing to the right and these are its ears you never perceive the duck and the rabbit at the same time. It's one or the other, and the percept flips between one state and the other. Uh, you can see the same thing if you've been staring at this cube for a while, it will seem that the, 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 the front and, and foreground and background will kind of flip. You get a figure ground reversal. Uh, so that's a feature of, of uh, perception. It's also, I'd make the case, it's a feature of stuttering as well. People who stutter are perfectly fluent for a while, and then they stutter, and then they go back to being fluent. So this may be an example of motor system multi-stability and we can use that to our advantage to understand brain dynamics because it's such a dramatic shift uh, between normal behavior and clearly abnormal behavior. So I, as, as Jerisha mentioned, I, I did a postdoc at UC Irvine at the medical school in neurology. So I've, I've had a longstanding interest in neurological disorders. People who stutter are special in lots of ways. Um, First, they have pretty normal brains. <laughs> so you don't see that in most neurological disorders. So that's a big plus for us trying to understand um, these brain dynamics uh, because for the most part, they're normal in terms of their brain. They're normal in terms of their cognition. They lead happy, healthy, normal lives. But they have this really dramatic impairment when they stutter and it's clear to even the non-expert when that something is wrong. Uh, so you have this very dynamic switching between normal and abnormal in the presence of a pretty normal brain. Uh, so we're using this uh, not only to understand stuttering for its own sake, but also as a model system to understand brain dynamics. Um, I'll just be very brief here. We're trying to understand the proximal reasons why people stutter. We want to know what's going on in the brain right before they stutter and compare that to when they try to speak and they're fluent. What's going on in the second or two before that? Uh, and that's somewhat different. And I think it's something that, that um, our AI methods are helping us make a lot of progress on because the, the neural codes right before you try to speak are very noisy. Uh, there's lots of things going on in the brain beyond just the motor program for stuttering. Uh, but we've been able to pull out some changes in the brain that, that reliably anticipate whether or not somebody is about to be fluent or disfluent. So we're predicting the future at least you know one or two seconds ahead of time. A lot of studies on stuttering, they look at kind of task averages over tens of minutes or how stuttering varies with the situation. Uh, one of the reasons I got into stuttering or one of the, the observations that intrigued me was people who stutter can come home and talk to the dogs and be perfectly fluent. 
but if they have to give a talk in front of others, they can be really disfluent. So there's something about the context, the situation that, that affects their, their fluency. Um, other differences, you know, neuroanatomy, anxiety, development, personality, also factor into why people stutter. But we're focusing on just the proximal neural mechanisms. Uh, and so we have people do a very simple task. Again, this is our usual cognitive psychology approach of just boiling down the phenomena to its basic essence and then testing that in a lab. So you can have people, for example, you give them something to say. You tell them, I'm giving you a cue. I want you to get ready to say car. Uh, for some purposes, uh, we present an auditory sound while they're getting ready to say the word car. That's to probe interactions between the motor and auditory system. I won't be able to talk about that very much, uh, but that's the rationale. And then we give them a picture and then they have to name the picture. And most of the time the picture matches what they're getting ready to say. Uh, but sometimes we switch it. Instead of showing them a, a car, we may show them a tree. And then they have to change their motor program from car to tree. And when they do that, that slows them down a lot more than what you have with people who don't stutter. And then we have control conditions where they're not preparing to say something. We just give them a bunch of X's and then they still, they see the picture, they have to name it. And so we did a bunch of studies on this uh, that we published a few years ago. And we found differences in EEG activity that, uh, that were reliably different between the people who stuttered relative to the, the controls. One measure was um, how auditory cortical responses were influenced by the motor system, which we think is important for normal fluency. That, uh, that upregulation of auditory responses that's, sent, that's due to a signal sent from motor areas um, was about half the size in people who stuttered. MWS uh, stood for men who stuttered because it was all men in this experiment. Um, we found differences in frontal areas of the brain uh, on the, the level of currents in people who stutter versus people who don't. And these EEG um, frequencies, like the, the piano that I was talking about uh, with Jerisha, certain frequencies showed much, um, much more greater reductions in their activity in people who stuttered a lot versus people who stuttered a little versus people who didn't stutter at all. So, we got these correlations between subjects. So we looked at people who stuttered a lot versus people who stuttered a little bit versus uh, minimally. And we got pretty strong correlations at several points when we gave them a cue, they're getting ready to speak, but before they actually try to speak. So again, that's how we could predict whether or not they were gonna be, be fluent, at least on average across subjects. But the question is, what about within people? You know, it's, if stutter, stuttering is multi-stable, so there's something about a person's brain that's different when they stutter versus when they are fluent. And so what might that be? That was the next step uh, in, in our, our work. And that's the part where we've also been pairing up with AI, our researchers, to try to decode that information. So we did our usual thing. We, we had them get ready to say a word versus a cue that says, just get ready to speak, but we're not gonna tell you what to say. And some of the experiments also had an auditory stimulus in between and others didn't. Um, we changed the, the, the task a little bit by making it harder, giving them uh, pseudo words. So novel snarf globos. It obeys the, the, the phonology of English, but those aren't of course real words. Uh, the subject needs to get ready to say that. And that increases their stuttering rate quite a bit. And that was important because we wanted to have a lot of trials where people were disfluent to compare with the trials where they are fluent. So we ended up getting on average about 50-50. Half of our EEG trials were for fluent, half were for disfluent. And for all the AI analyses, we had, it was exactly 50-50. So uh, the networks that they had to guess whether somebody would be fluent or disfluent, they had a 50-50 shot of being correct. All right, so I'm just gonna skip this slide because it's getting a little late. I wanted to just add in one other measure that we had for individuals, uh, which was a network measure that showed reliable differences before trials where they were fluent versus disfluent. And so this was interesting because it showed connections between areas long been known to be important for speaking. Uh, the inferior frontal gyrus over here in the brain, Wernicke's area over here, and premotor cortex up here. That if you measure the, the interactions or, the, or the, the, the correlation between EEG frequencies, um, you can measure that similar to a correlation uh, overall. Uh, it's called coherence. And that coherence, when people were fluent, was greater than when they were disfluent. So it's as if these areas of the brain that are meant to talk to each other, um, talk past each other right before people stutter. And when they don't stutter, the areas seem to have good communication. Uh, so that's another new, new result that, that we found in this study. And we also replicated some of our previous results across subjects. So 
enter uh, Paul Rad and Arun Das. Uh, so they're also at a UTSA. Uh, and they also work, um, Paul founded the, the, the Open Cloud Institute. Uh, Arun's his uh, doctoral student and Arun is terrific, by the way. Uh, so is Tim Liu that worked with uh, Yufe. Uh, they've both been just great. I'm, I'm endlessly impressed with these guys as far as what they've been able to do. Uh, so what we're doing, we bring in people into lab who stutter doing this task that I just uh, uh, explained. And we're also measuring facial muscle activity. And so we have a video, we measure video, we not only we measure EEG with the EEG cap. We have an eye tracker that can measure where their eyes are pointing in space and also their pupil dilation, which relates to, we can use that as an index of brain activity to some degree. And we can look at their facial muscles right before they get ready to speak and measure micro expressions. So these are very subtle changes in, in the face. They're not making funny faces or grimacing or anything um, that reflect, we think, output from motor cortex as well as the basal ganglia, which are both important in stuttering. Uh, so this is kind of a proxy for what might be going on in the brain. And uh, um, Arun and, and Paul and, and, the, and the rest of us, um, we use the video and then analyze it using AI networks and different types of AI networks I'll get to in a minute, uh, not, not just regular um, CNNs, uh, using the spatial video. And we measure muscle activity using things called action units, which themselves require a network to decode. And we can find these subtle differences in action units that anticipate whether or not the person is going to be fluent or disfluent when they speak a second or two later. Uh, we found changes in the facial muscles around the eyes that occurred early on between the cue and, and the target that I, that I showed in this paradigm. And there are subtle differences around the, the facial area, or I'm sorry, the, the lip area of the face and the jaw right before they got ready to speak. Uh, and, and I'll get to the explainability AI in a minute on kind of how that may relate to speech preparation. We also found this pupil dilation response also reliably showed a difference on the trials that they were about to be fluent. You had a bigger pupil dilation versus when they were disfluent. Uh, and that makes some sense as far as attentional preparation goes. And the classification accuracy here is well above the 50-50 chance. Uh, for the eye tracking is right around 70%. Uh, for this particular uh, model, for the facial action units, it was, it was north of 80%. So that's, that's not too shabby as far as trying to predict whether somebody's going to stutter in the, in the future just by looking at their face. Uh, so this is a very recent article that uh, is under review for actually the, the AAAI meeting. Uh, and I'm running out of time, so I don't want, want to kind of go through this in too much detail. In addition, I can't go into too much detail as far as the specifics of the CNNs, but basically we, we used the trial video as input. We uh, had a network to define the micro expressions. And then we used that to train up um, the CNN model here to try to predict stuttering or not, shown here with the, the classifier layers. And then we use an explanation map generator in order to try to find the AUs on the face and then visualize, overlay that with the subject's video um, those areas that are showing these changes, these rapid changes over time. And then we compared that with two other um, CNNs that were, were um, not self-supervised. Um, They're similar to the VGG, which was fully supervised. And then asked kind of how well did these perform? So here's a very large data set, but I just want to point out that they, they all perform pretty well. Um, the the, the, the self-supervised one has, has the benefit that theoretically we could use less data in order to get more bang for the buck out of it versus these other networks over here. But they're all pretty good for the AUCs right around 75.75 to 80, even as we took out more and more of the data for the training. Uh, and then the, the validation and test trials, we had more for that. Uh, it still maintained pretty good performance with that. So we're, the, the bottom line is we're able to read out a lot of and predict fluency just from looking at the subject's spatial videos. And that can make neurological sense as far as these, these pathways that lead from the brain motor areas to the facial muscles. Using explainable AI, we found that these upper facial muscles, the action units that were near the top of the face, uh, showed indeed you know, that, that those were the ones that at the beginning of the trial showed best predicted whether or not the subject would be fluent or not. And then muscles around the, the lips, which is, an, of course, a speech articulator, use your lips to speak. Those are getting ready to be activated. Not yet, because they're not speaking, but they're getting ready. And that signal seems to show predictability for fluency versus disfluency shortly before the time where they're asked to talk. All right. 
Uh, so I, I need to just, um, I won't go into this in detail, but, but having this video available opens up a lot of applications for using uh, that as a training method for speech therapy. Uh, you could do this outside of a lab. You don't have, need to have a fancy EEG setup or fMRI setup or anything like that to potentially use this facial video as a proxy for what's going on in the brain and then try to train the subject to get into the brain state that's conducive to being fluent. I mentioned that we think about motor, the motor system as being multi-stable. It can go from a state conducive to being fluent to disfluent. Potentially, we could train subjects to keep their brains in the state more often that's conducive to being fluent if we can do that, then they, their stuttering should go down, if they should do it less. So there, I think there's a lot of possibility in the future for applying some of what we're measuring in the lab to speech therapy. All right, so just kind of summarize. So I was talking a lot about kind of the brain as a, a fundamentally dynamic information processing system. Uh, and we're trying to use AI methods to read out the coding of this dynamic brain processing, understand the brain mechanisms that lead to that information processing coding. Um, and we've been able to use this in two different domains. One's on spatial cognition uh, and the other's on speech fluency. And both we've been able to pull out a fair amount of information, not only just from EEG signals that directly reflect brain activity, but from these video signals that are an indirect um, measure of brain activity. Uh, this is, uh, work has been massively collaborative. I'm just the, the sort of the, the mouthpiece for you all here, um, but Jeff Mock is, is um, a research professor. Uh, it's really our lab, not my lab, but He's a co-director. Uh, John Myers is my doctoral student. Farzan is a speech language pathologist at Texas State. Uh, Kay, Mark, Yufei, Tim, Paul, and Arun are all at UC UTSA in various um, departments. Uh, and it's just been a whole lot of fun working with these people. And of course, we're grateful for funding from NSF, NIH, and the Malcolm Frazier Foundation. So thanks a lot, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I think we have one question in the chat window. Anurag, do you want to ask the question? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. So uh, one question I had was like when you were reading the, when you were basically getting the inputs from the EG channels, right? So like, uh, like uh, in our slide where you were showing like how these different regions respond to a certain input, right? For, I think it was for the fluency testing. That so, like, uh, to get the reading of a certain region, do you just do you, do you do you have to first figure out which channel, uh, which channel's reading is considered for that region? And if that is the case, won't it vary for different people based on the placement of that mm -hmm. node on their head? Right. Uh, here, let's let me go to this slide. So it depends on on the specific uh, part of the study. Sometimes we we examine signals directly just from the EEG electrodes. In which case, um, actually, maybe I'll move. I had an extra slide down here. I think it may be a little better to illustrate. Okay, here. Um, so each electrode is picking up signals generated from many different parts of the brain. So that's why the spatial resolution of EEG is not as yeah. good as other methods such as functional MRI. Um, so if you measure activity, let's say this electrode, some of that activity indeed is generated by neurons that are underneath that electrode. But that doesn't mean that all the activity is from that location. And even you can have large signals that summate from distant locations. We see this in the auditory system quite a bit. Um, so you have some sense of what's going on in the brain, where in the brain it's happening just from scalp electrodes. But it's not a very reliable metric. Uh, you can use biophysical modeling to get a better sense of if there's a current in, I hope you can see kind of this little, little uh, uh, my cursor over here. If there's a current, let's say over here where this yellow circle is in Wernicke's area, then we would expect to see this kind of signal um, at this electrode and a weaker signal at this electrode and an even weaker signal at this electrode towards the front. You can do this biophysical modeling to come up with an educated guess about where the currents are generated in the brain. So sometimes we do that, that's called current source density modeling. Uh, we do another thing, which I didn't have time to really talk about called independent component analysis, which use, it's similar to principal component analysis, and I think it's better suited for, for doing uh, neurophysiological studies because it, it specifically tries to identify independent signals. 
And so the percent variance of any one signal is generally not that high. It's only usually a few percentage uh, percent. Uh, but that's more what you would expect from a signal in this part of the brain, a signal here, and a signal there, and a signal there, and so on. Uh, so we use independent component analysis quite a bit in our lab for that purpose. So you put all this together um, with the known anatomy and, and the importance of certain areas of the brain for particular tasks, such as if I present a sound, I know I'm very confident about auditory cortical responses to that sound that we can measure with EEG. There's a long line of convergent evidence on that. Um, so you put it all together and you can have educated um, ideas about the currents in the brain that are generating the signals that we're measuring. And then you want to use other methods as well. You know, animal studies, for example, where you can place electrodes directly inside the brain or fMRI studies where you lose the temporal information for the most part, but you get more spatial information. And you use, you try to get convergent evidence to, to see whether or not your, your um, theories are correct or not. So that's the approach that we take. Is, um, thanks, Ed. There is another question from Greg. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. Um, so I'm curious if this, you know, other applications of kind of this strategy um, to like uh, uh, dyslexia, uh, other things that are uh, uh, a functional uh, kind of events. Yeah, it's. Um... I'm viewing this, the, the work with people who stutter as really a test bed for um, applications to more complicated um, developmental as well as neurologic, you know, neurological disorders. Um, and so this, you know, and, I'm sorry, uh, dyslexia would also, that would be a great application. Um, one of the areas that I want to move in to is looking at um, neurodegenerative conditions and Alzheimer's disease and trying to come up with ways to get more out of the brain that you have. You know, given that there's brain pathology, there's a wide variation in, in functionality. Some people have, are riddled with Alzheimer's pathology and they didn't know they were demented because they led a normal life. Other people have relatively mild Alzheimer's pathology and are quite demented. And of course, you know, usually there's a correlation between the pathological load and function, but it's not near one. <laughs> um, so it suggests there's a lot of room for retraining the brain to work better. And so in the case of, of people with dyslexia, for example, yes, is there a way to kind of get the circuits to work well when they read something successfully? What did the brain do versus when they misread it, misperceive it? Yeah, I'm curious, uh, have you interacted with any of the uh, projects or programs or investigators from like uh, some of the DARPA programs in this area? I'm familiar with some of the work where they were doing studying epileptic uh, patients, uh, you know, part of the brain injury you know, mm -hmm. part of the brain injury research, but also for, for, for DARPA, but also, um, you know, control and, uh, and correcting for, uh, you know, brain misfunction. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar that there's specific programs, but I see a huge upside with the ability to, to read out what the brain is doing. We know that it responds and changes. You, you learn to just, just in watching the, the, this talk, everybody's brain, I changed all of your brains, guys. <laughs> You're gonna remember something about this for positive or negative, whatever. You may have hated it, but there's still a representation in your brain about why you hated my talk, okay? <laughs> or liked it or whatever. Um, so we know that the, the brain is plastic. And so can we harness that in a pr principled way by reading out codes, knowing specifically kind of what is it doing when we get the desired target performance, whether it's good reading, whether it's somebody with Alzheimer's disease that was able to remember their daughter's name that day, the next day they may not be able to remember. Well, what did the brain do on Tuesday when they remembered their daughter's name that it didn't do on Wednesday when they didn't remember, right? Um, so it's a very, a very basic strategy that I think has just a world of application for neurological disorders, psychiatric disorders. There's also, you know, people can think about this, okay, can this make me smarter, make me better for my SATs or whatever, you know, there's that sort of application too, but I'm more interested in, in the people that have real problems and try to help them. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question. I know we are a little uh, over our time, but there's one last question. Um, Peter, do you want to ask the question? Sure, hi, I'm Hello. Peter. Thank you, that's a very interesting talk. Uh, I, you mentioned at one point that you, detected uh, a lack of synchronization between Wernicke's area and some frontal motor area mm -hmm. when people were about to stutter. That sounds really interesting. And are you looking into that further and trying to understand what's going on? 
We are. Yeah, I've been uh, scrambling to revise an NIH grant that's due on November 5th. <laughs> uh, exactly on that. Yeah, and it has a, a big AI component to it. Yes. So, and I only showed you a few of the results for that. Actually, there just wasn't enough time. But we're we're getting lots of signals that that anticipate the speech outcome, whether or not somebody's fluent or disfluent. So it, it's not for lack of signals. It's really kind of understanding what they mean, relating that to everyday life versus these, um, you know, canned laboratory situations. Uh, and then trying to have an eye towards application. That, that's been probably the biggest challenge. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ed, for your talk. Um, Thank you. And uh, we, look, we look forward to seeing you all next week then. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>